uh, Optics and Quantum Electronics Seminar. It's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Amir Gadimi. Uh, Amir, maybe you can already start sharing yeah. your screen. Uh, so uh, Amir, many of you guys know Amir already. Uh, so he obtained his uh, PhD in electrical engineering in 2018 from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. Uh, this is the EPFL. Uh, where he worked uh, with Tobias Kippenberg on quantum optical mechanics, precision sensing, and applications of high Q optical and mechanical resonators. So I actually was looking forward to uh, the latest uh, results on that front, and he certainly has them. Uh, Amir has continued to work in that area from the last time he gave a talk at MIT about about two years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he's also started something really new and exciting, and that is that he uh, has uh, joined the Swiss Center for Electronics and Micro Nanotechnology, CSEM, as a senior scientist and group leader. And he's leading, uh, he's uh, set, you know, leading an effort there uh, in the areas of photonic integrated circuits um, based on uh, for sensing. Um, uh, based on uh, PSC platforms uh, using silicon nitride and thin film lithium niobate. So some really exciting stuff coming out of there that we're going to hear about today. Uh, suppose you can, and if you sign up for a private conversation, you can talk about the other stuff after the talk. Um, the, he's received a bunch of awards. Uh, so in particular, the Swiss National Funding Bridge Discovery Grant in 2020, the Swiss Physical Society uh, 2019 Young Scientist Award, the Swiss Nanotechnology Best PhD Award 2018, and the European Frequency and Time Forum Best Paper Award in 2018. So Amir, great to have you. Looking forward to what uh, you've done. <laughs> last yeah. couple of years. Well, thank you so much, Derek and Stefan for having me. It's a really great pleasure and an honor actually to, to, to give this talk. Uh, uh, I was actually uh, honored to give another talk two years ago when I visited MIT in uh, 2019. So back then I discussed about my other sort of you know, leg of research, as you mentioned about uh, you know, quantum optical mechanics. This is where my roots and backgrounds you know, in my PhD studies actually uh, originated. And, uh, but today actually I want to discuss about a different venture uh, that, that we took uh, you know, in my group. So this is a new platform uh, we work, uh, you know, primarily at CSEM. So we start working on this also in 2019, and uh, you know, for for a, uh, for a motivation actually uh, to use it for nonlinear application. But uh, you know, one thing led to another, and we realized that actually why we stopped just you know like you know using these ticks uh, you know in our own lab, uh, but uh, we can actually offer it to other you know colleagues and you know really expand the collaboration and this is what i want to talk about so so with that sort of you know introduction let me sort of you know, jump a little bit uh, you know in, in, into details of my talk so today i'm going to discuss about the as i mentioned new platform on lithium niobate and insulator which we got very excited about it recently uh, it's a great platform to do you know electro optics and nonlinear stuff and uh, look, uh, this is the project what is, is known as Elena in my, at CSEM. So what you see as the you know, sort of you know, first picture is actually a you know, bunch of chips and uh, you know, like peaks we are fabricating on a monthly and weekly basis uh, in LNOI. Right, so we are happy to actually offer this, you know, sort of uh, fa or fabrication expertise as a sort of a foundry model to any people who are interested. Actually, this one of the people initiated this was Derek himself, who contacted me back uh, in in summer 2020. And uh, you know, at MIT we have an ongoing collaboration with, with with his team, and I'm happy to actually expand it. Hopefully, at the end of this talk, I can actually convince you that this might be interesting for for, for you as well. Okay, so with that again introduction, let me let me start. So I want to take like a few minutes to just introduce also like CSEM before actually getting to the technical part of my talks, as you know might not be as famous uh, you know in US and especially in MIT as it is in Switzerland. So 
so where I'm here at CSCN, this is a you know research institute uh, located in Neuchâtel, and to give you a sort of a one slide you know background of where our roots and background coming from, actually it CSCN started around the you know formed in uh, 1960s and 70s uh, in a period known as sort of a watch crisis. So really, or roots and backgrounds coming from really watch industry. So the story is that you know Swiss used to be a uh, like has uh, used to had the largest share in watch uh, high end uh, you know watch watch market, and uh, you know they sort of invented their own downfall quartz watch at the time. They didn't see the value like uh, there is a famous quote from one of these uh, CEOs of one of these watch companies that actually quartz doesn't have any future. And uh, at the same time, in the U.S. and Japan, what this uh, sort of boom of microelectronic was happening, they took the watch idea that was initially wanted in Neuchâtel, and then made this you know digital watch. That led to a sort of you know what is known as you know watch crisis. I think some 70,000 jobs were lost, and you know almost the whole watch industry of Swiss was destroyed. And at the time, actually, there was a you know, kind of new act by government to actually, you know, uh, prevent these sort of technological surprises. So three watch, big uh, watch groups, the lab laboratories were merged, and that's how CSCM actually was formed. And still, really, watch industry is one of our, you know, sort of, you know, pillars. Uh, you know, in the and we continued research in this. In the last few sort of uh, years, we reinvented really watch industry using silicon technology of you know making uh, you know mechanical uh, resonators for watch out of like uh, hair springs and others you know from silicon so this is really you know, pioneered by CSM we can f see a few examples of you know a few watch famous watchmakers but uh, CSM actually quite you know grew from that uh, it's like watch is no longer our main business so when you have a lot of you know technical people in one place you can actually you know, do more engineering and you know, CSM grew to become an art, what is known as an RTO, is a research and technology organization. And what we do really is we, we are sort of a half public, half private. We like develop technology. We are not academia, but we are not real industry. So we normally take ideas from industry like academia, we mature them to technology and then you know, give it to the, you know, to the industry for community. This is where we sort of you know, see ourselves. So in terms of what where CSM is today, just you know, just give you an overview of the research pillars we are doing. So there are five pillars that actually we are really good at it. Micro technology. Uh, I gave you one example of this, you know, and output of this micro micro technology was watch hair springs. All the photonic activities, integrated photonic activities that I'm, uh, you know, I'm going to like actually uh, talk about today, is in this, you know, uh, division. But it's it grew more than that, so we have. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Uh, so now we have a, actually a large division in surface engineering. For example, one one uh, product we had was this security features in French. It was actually bought uh, and implemented in French passports. Ultra low power electronic is our, one of our fortes. Uh, again, for example, this example I put here is a four cell uh, camera. Uh, which you know, one of them is, is just a camera. Three, three others is a solar cell. You can just stick it, so it's it's a sort of a autonomous uh, device. Photovoltaics is another you know pillar of our research. Especially, we are interested in colored uh, uh, PV panels. This picture that you're seeing is not actually a picture. It's a, really a solar cell that you know each, each pixel is actually a cell, and you can really create like aesthetic features you know, for, for building, for adaptation of solar cells. And lastly, systems. So we are also very active in system integration, which you know, we take some sensors, maybe you know, from CSM or uh, like, you know, commercial available, and we really put, make uh, a full system, full product. For example, here's like a fer uh, like fertility uh, tracking bracelet that actually be developed for a startup. So this sort of you know, gives you a sort of uh, flavor of different research topics we are doing at CSM. Uh, also, some statistics. So we are about uh, it's very multinational, you know, uh, company uh, or, uh, and research organization. We are about 500 people. We are very good actually in European research, uh, EU fundings. We are trying to expand also a little bit to US, which I'm really happy to actually start new collaborations. 
And uh, in terms of like, you know, where we are located, I don't know if how much you know about Switzerland, but our uh, headquarters is in Neuchâtel area, where I am right now, but we have few centers in Zurich, uh, you know, near uh, Basel, in near Bern, and other places. And uh, so with that, uh, let me, so, so that's sort of, you know, my few slides, you know, summary of like what CSM just to give you a flavor of like where I'm coming from. And uh, like last on you know, CSM in general, our mission is really to support the technological uh, development in Switzerland first, but then Europe and hopefully worldwide. And uh, we are really good as, as I mentioned at this, you know, establishing this uh, cooperation agreement and creating a startup. This is really the two, you know, you know like industrial pillars, you know, from CSM side, that's where we see the revenue. Okay, so with that, let me, introduce you like the photonic activities at CSCM. Photonic is a big part of you know, CSCM, uh, which we have multiple groups. We are active in you know wide range of areas from uh, you know packaging to like systems, laser sources, metrology, and integrated photonic circuits, which is you know really my group. And where we want to be at the you know the corporate level is we want to be a sort of a you know, one-stop shop for photonics that you know we can offer a wide range of you know expertise from fabrication all the way to packaging and testing. So again, before I go into the details of you know, lithium ion bit, just a few examples of type of research we do you know in photonics. One famous you know in, uh, one area is diffractive wavewise, miniaturized atomic clocks is an example, augmented reality. Uh, we do have a lot of activities in photonic packaging, which is especially important for integrated photonics because that's where the 80% of the cost of a photonic product is actually is sitting in packaging. So we have a, quite a lot of activities. Uh, sensors, this is probably the biggest part of the research in photonic domain at CSCM. So various sensor fluorescence, particle detections, uh, interferometry. Uh, laser and met metrology is also very big at CSM. So, you know, we make um, anywhere from, you know, like uh, oscillators to, like, you know, uh, femtosecond laser, frequency comms, astronomy, a lot of activities in metrology uh, and interferometry, LIDAR. Uh, and actually, I also mentioned this, you know, miniaturized atomic clock. So, this is sort of, you know, uh, you know gives you an overview of different activities at CSM. And that brings me to, you know, my topic today integrated photonics. And I'm actually leading the group uh, centered around the research in integrated photonics. And at CSCM, we are developing two platforms. I mean, one platform, my silicon nitro is sort of, you know, imported from EPFL from my PhD studies. And lithium nitride and insulator is a new venture we actually sort of, you know, started recently. And this is the topic of this discussion. And, you know, this sort of artistic view of, you know, uh, on the right, sort of almost summarizes a lot of capabilities of lithium nitride. I mean, I, uh, you probably are all more experts in this topic than I am, but lithium nitride is one of the very interesting photonic materials. It combines many of the interesting photonic features, such as having uh, electro-optic, strong electro-optic effect, very nice nonlinearity. And this is sort of, you know, summarize one of the, you know, biggest motivation and, and project that we are leading that is known as WDM modulator, WDM uh, transceivers. So at lithium nitride on the same, on the one same die from one wavelength using third nonlinearity, we can generate multiple wavelengths in a, like a frequency calm, care calm. We can actually separate them modulate them, like separate each wavelength, modulate them separately, and then put them back together for high data rates and all on the same die for high data transceiver. So this is one of the key application areas. But what I want to emphasize is actually at CSCM in my group, we are not only interested in peaks for peaks, okay? So really my, the name of my group is actually peak plus. And what do I mean by peak plus? We are really interested in functionalizing integrated photonic circuit. And there are different ways to functionalize it. For example, you know, we can, you know, marry peaks with mechanical transducers. And this is where like we're optomechanical activities. I gave a talk two years ago on this. We still have a strong, uh, you know, research uh, on this domain where or, or research, you know, varies from, you know, really sensors that we can sell like uh, accelerometers 
to really quantum of the mechanics, uh, you know, mass sensing. So we have a lot of activities uh, with our academic partners for magnetic uh, nano, MRF, nano MRFM, so magnetic resonance uh, force microscopy and force sensing. So this is sort of, you know, functionalizing quick, quick mechanics. So recently we have also started a new, you know, sort of a separate venture on functionalizing PIC with chemical or biotransducer or microfluidics for really uh, optochemical sensing. So this is was especially motivated with this, you know, sort of COVID situation to find a way to actually detect bio, um, you know, bio, uh, uh, you know, biomarkers. We can especially take advantage of the frequency comms for spectroscopy, on chip spectroscopy, or other you know methods of uh, actually detection. So this is pretty young in my group, but another sort of you know functionalization is the one that actually I want to talk today. It's what we call it electrical functionalization, and so where we sort of you know marry electronics and peaks. And in order to do this, you need to have the right material. Like silicon nitride is not the right material for do it, and this is where we're lithium nibid activities. So really functionalizing peaks with electronics. Okay, so with that, uh, let me you know, kind of introduce uh, you know, in more details or activities. So why peak? Why we are interested in peak and applications of peak? I mean, many people actually can answer to this question from different perspectives, but from my perspective, peaks have several technical advantages, such as flexible and scalable like, you know, integration, low cost, robust miniaturization. But really from the scientific point of view, there is some things that we can do in integrated photonics and especially integrated photonics that you cannot do it in any other domain. For example, in electronics. So we have quantum limited source sets at room temperature. This is really great uh, you know, assets to do anything interesting quantum at, especially at room temperature, again, in electronics, you don't have this duality, you're thermal limited, uh, even if you're working at gigahertz, so you have to work at low temperatures in order to do anything interesting quantum. Another really asset we have, which doesn't have any duality, is this you know, really high Q cavities. It doesn't have a duality in electronics. We can make cavities easily with Qs in excess of one million at very small areas, and this, uh, at room temperature. And this, again, this is a very unique feature, and really, uh, what we gain is everything, whether it's quantum or sensing, coming from this you know, quality divided by this mode volume. We can have really high coherence at very small scale. This allows us either to see nonlinearities at very low power, or do very interesting sensitivity uh, measurements, or approach quantum regime at reasonable power threshold. So this is really why, like you know, in one slide, why I'm interested in PIC. Okay, so. But why lithium nibid? What is the real motivation? And again, there are different ways to motivate what lithium nibid. I, I like to look at, you know, from the application science. And one obvious application is really telecom. So we need more bandwidth. This is clear in coming uh, coming uh, years. There is a there was a report by Cisco actually. Uh, it, it came out actually uh, two years ago that um, they predicted that internet bandwidth would grow by the rate of 100x per decade. So what the internet, what we have at 2020, the entire bandwidth we have would be only 1% of the internet in 2030. So, and you have to remember most of this data, 99% of this data is carried over optical fiber. So in the next decade, obviously we need more and faster modulators. And this is where Lithium nibid is lithium nibid on insulator is very strong. And it's not just about the bandwidth, it's also about the power consumption. So ICT sector in total is consuming somewhere around 10% of the total energy in the world. And this is just this percentage is increasing to 20%. So we are actually consuming a lot of power, and a lot of this power is this. Heat in just data, so uh, you know, save quite a lot of energy. And there is a big trend in industry going from uh, long distance to bring the optics from the rack to rack, cheap to uh, you know, uh, board to board, or even cheap to cheap. So this is really like you know, two big industrial motivations. But also from the academic point of view, 
It's the fact, uh, you know, to do, uh, you know, optic electro electro optic control at not telecom wavelengths. For example, probably this is the interest, you know, from Trix Group and hopefully others. If you are doing, especially for example, for a lot of quantum applications, you're doing um, this ion trapping. A lot of these transitions are at near or are invisible. And unfortunately, you don't have any industrial or any commercial platform that actually can miniaturize your, your peak. So, you know, in telecom, you have other alternatives, just Illinois can do it better. But for other wavelengths, pretty much lithium nibate is currently the only solution. And beside this application, obviously nonlinear photonics and metrology and, and calm generation was or initial actually interest. And really lithium nibate has a really combination of unique uh, uh, nonlinearity, both strong chi 2 and chi 3 And add, to, add on top of this that, you know, we can achieve very small bending radii at, uh, that you know, allows us to reduce the footprint of the chips. So all of this combined is actually where people are really interested. So either they need the fast modulators or they need it, uh, you know, the nonlinear effect and this integration aspect. So, and if you want to do pick, there are many things, many platforms that you can choose. Uh, you know, in photonics, it's not like you know electronics that you know silicon is the full dominant you know uh, platform. In photonics, you have many options. I mean, I put few of the just you know commercially available and famous one. I mean, the list is not the most exclusive list. The list is uh, far more than this. So, uh, just apologies for the people who are doing you know plasmonics or um, polymer photonics. I know there are other options, but these are really the success. I would say commercially successful ones. And each of these platforms, they have their own you know, pros and the cons. For example, you have a group of materials such as especially silicon nitride or silicon intrinsically, which we know them as sort of a passive platforms. I mean, here you can make ring resonators, like waveguides, resonators, couplers, but that's about it, right? You're limited to these sort of you know, components, still very useful for a lot of sensing or nonlinear applications. But what I want to say is that, you know, you're limited to this module. So it's, you have very limited actually uh, components. So there are, the second group of components is, you know, like lithium nibate intrinsically or silicon, if you do some special things like dope it, uh, they, they are known, you know, they, we know them as sort of semi-active platform. Normally they come with a large electro-optic coefficient that allows you to electronically control light in the, in the chip. And if you have these options, then the things that you can do grows significantly uh, broader. You're not just doing waveguides and resonators, but you can do a lot more novel modules, like as modulators, phase shifters, tunable cavities, switches, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And especially for the case of lithium nibate, very uniquely, actually you can do uh, also very unique nonlinear. Uh, interactions such as wavelength convergence, super continuum generation, second harmonic generation, et cetera, et cetera. And lastly, obviously, you have this, you know, like indirect bang gap, 3-5, indium first five, gallium arsenide, et cetera, et cetera. These guys, you know, because of their indirect bang gaps, they can actually be photonically active. So you can do active components such as lasers, photodetectors, LED, et cetera, et cetera. And what I want to you know, convince you, hopefully, is that in this two sides of the spectrum, this passive and active, there has been a lot of work. And unfortunately, this you know, middle part, which in my opinion has one of the strongest uh, sort of uh, poten potentials is actually a little bit neglected uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in the community, in the industry and literature. And my way of sort of you know, saying that is like, look at the foundries that actually offer this platform, the commercial foundries. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm only looking at European, uh, you know, foundries. I'm, I'm sort of you know, less uh, knowledgeable about the US ones. I'm sure US is actually even more, you have more options. But if you just look at the European market for silicon nitrate, you have a ton of, like, you know, a lot of foundries, Lionix, Lygentex. So some of you might actually already work with some of these foundries. Silicon, you have a ton of them, three files, again, many. This is even not the most exclusive list in, in Europe. There are many more. This is just the most famous ones. But lithium niobate, nobody, okay? Except there is a, you know, from the, this uh, startup coming from Marco Lankar group, uh, just, you know, few, uh, less than probably a kilometer north of you guys in, in Harvard, there is no player in Europe. I mean, there are just few academics groups. So if you want to get your hands 
on an LNOI peak, the only option you have right now is to invest millions of dollars on you know, learning how to fabricate it. And this is the gap that we want to fill. So we want to offer our LNOI or offer our fabrications for academic and industrial users. And hopefully by the end of this meeting, we can actually uh, you know, have a you know, few more uh, collaboration. Uh, uh, we'd be very delighted to actually offer you this. So, but why lithium nitrate? Why LNOI? Why LNOI is interesting? And this is like sort of, you know, my one slide that I want to really advertise the why LNOI is particularly interesting. For, for, first of all, LNOI, uh, lithium nitrate, has one of the highest electro-optic coefficients in any material. And this effect is intrinsic, so it's a partial effect. And uh, it, it's very, so it, it and allows us to do very efficient modulation and at very high speeds. Remember, the crystal response time to electric field is in the order of 10 to second. So actually you're not limited by any like diffusion process of electrons or holes. It's just literally your limit is the design of your RF circuit, not the electro-optic effect, right? So it's very fast, very efficient, but as a bonus, you also have very, uh, you know, high chi 2 and chi 3 nonlinearity. So we are not just talking about modulators, but actually some novel functionalities that you cannot find in any other platform. Uh, we, using this uh, nonlinearities, we can do very interesting stuff. Uh, second harmonic generation, I'll show you an example of this frequency calm generation, super continuum generation, wavelength conversion, we can easily convert wavelengths from one to another. And as a bonus, okay, so, Low like lithium nitrate, unlike semiconductors, it has a really large band gap. And I just, you know, actually before this meeting, coming from a meeting with another customer, and they were saying that actually, uh, you know, they do like you know they, they've been working with indium phosphide for some time, but they start to see the limitations because they have they cannot pump enough power in their modulators. You know, if they keep pumping powers, the modulators saturate because of the two photon absorption because the band gaps in these. Silicon indium phosphates are normally one or two electron volts. For lithium nitrate, this is around 4.9 electron volts. This allows us to put a lot of optical power in our circuits without you know, having to deal with two photon absorption. And we can do it in a very wide trans like, you know, uh, wavelength window. It's lithium nitrate is transparent tr from 350 all the way to 5.5, so it covers the wide range of visible near uh, or mid or telecom band. So, so, so you have a lot of actually wavelengths, and as I'm going to show you, it's very low loss material as well. I mean, we are not even close to a factor of 10 to the limit of the loss of the material. Normally, this 0.2 dB per centimeter is what we achieve, and it's limited by the sidewall roughness. I'll come back to this. So, so, so this is sort of you know shows you you know the the few of the you know like the the, the cross section of our waveguides. Normally we work with the uh, you know we partially etch. We have the ability to fully etch, but we for very good reasons we partially etch. It shows the confinement of the modes. We can do very sharp, relatively sharp bends with with limited to low losses that actually allows us to do very dense integration. And just if I want to compare it, you might be familiar with this traditional you know, lithium nitrate. I'm not saying lithium nitrate is a new photonic material by no way, no. Lithium nitrate was invented in 1970s, okay? And I think it has been ever since used and still if you want to buy an off-shelf electro optic modulator from Solab, they are still based on this you know, sort of you know, bulk technology. So how they traditionally used to make modulators and waveguides, normally the traditional method was to take a crystal of lithium nitrate and make waveguides by doping you know, some regions, uh, some waveguides in it. In the same, in the same spheres, in the same way, you're making optical fiber. By using this you know, titanium diffusion uh, you know, waveguides, you can create a region slightly highly, uh, higher doped to create a small refractive index contrast to kind of confine the light. But the downside of this, you know, sort of bulk technology is that the refractive index contrast you generate with this method is very small. So delta n is in the order of 0.02. Since you have such a small refractive index contrast, the mode volume becomes really large in the order of tens of microns. So when you have such a mode, large mode volume, few things that actually happen. So now you have to, for example, imagine putting the electrodes 
really outside of the optical mode. So now your electrodes are further apart. So you have to apply higher electric field. Your speed goes down. Your power consumption goes down. And this is like your bending radius is in the order of millimeters. So you cannot really pack a lot of things. So what we really do in, and this is where most of the advantages really come in. What we really do in LNOI, we make wave wide not by doping, but actually by etching. And with this method, actually, we can create much higher refractive index contrast, confine the light in much smaller mode volume, put the electrodes much closer, we can make modulators with V pies below one volt. And at the bonus, we gain on the speed, the intensity goes up, so we can do nonlinear effect at much lower power. So really, all I'm saying is that actually, uh, you might actually, you know, take this lightly, but really the innovation, the core innovation of the LNOI compared to the traditional lithium novel is only coming from this, you know, mode size reduction. And that's a significant reduction. It's in the order of actually 100x reduction of mode, mode volume. And this is how you really gain on these things. So also, I think it's fair if I compare it with semiconductor technologies that, you know, a lot of uh, researchers in this audience are maybe more familiar. Indeed, as I mentioned, you can modulate, make modulators in silicon or other semiconductors, 3-5 semiconductors, they normally don't have an intrinsic parcel effect, so you have to induce this effect. And there are various methods to induce it, and, but normally uh, they are, like, a lot of them are based on actually putting electrons or holes into, the, uh, into your waveguide. You know, methods such as carrier injection or carrier depletion. Indeed, if you do this, you can change the refractive index of silicon or like, semi your semiconductor, but this has a downside. And the downside of this is that uh, you will have to now deal with photon electron scattering, meaning that actually with, in these methods, you induce extra losses as you modulate your modulator. And I sort of, you know, sort of, it means that you change the real part, but also the imaginary part of reflective index. I think uh, I took this, I borrowed this little plot from Marco Lonker's uh, paper which they beautifully actually summarize the effect uh, in this. So they, you know, sort of uh, uh, compare the V pi versus the like excess losses or phase shifted losses. So what you have to remember, like reading this plot, we can always make V pi or uh, volt, operating voltage of these modulators lower and lower by going to longer and longer devices. Okay. But when you have a longer devices, the losses, the extra losses become more apparent. So that's why you have this, uh, you know, sort of this sort of lines. So for example, look at silicon. I and mean, in silicon, if you want to make a modulator which is long enough to have a VPI of one volt, you lose 20 of dB of the light just in the modulator. And I'm not talking about waveguide losses. This is an excess modulation losses, right? So plasmonics, we all know because of the metal in the electric is worse, polymers in the same ballpark. With indium phosphate, you can do a little bit better, but look at LNOI. With LNOI, since the effect is intrinsic, it's partial effect, you can do very deep modulations, but almost with little to no additional losses. So we are above one volt dB, okay? So this is really uh, the advantage of lithium now. So we can do it really fast, but also at very low losses and power consumption and very low VPI. So making modulators below one volt is very common actually these days uh, in our group. And, so, and, and if these advantages are not good enough, add on top of this that you know, we can operate, we have much lower transparency window, we can operate below 1.1 uh, micro, micrometer. You can pull, we can put a lot more power so you don't have two photon in, uh, absorption issue. Uh, so for the case of silicon, I mean, we don't have intrinsic chi 2 so you cannot do all this non interesting nonlinear effect. And add on top of it, this is a dielectric by nature. So it's intrinsically more resistance to harsh environment. That's why, for example, ESA is one of our, you know, uh, one of our biggest supporters because they want to deploy this technology in the space where you have a lot of radiation. So dielectrics are more resilient. So, and a lot of these effects that I'm, you know, sort of saying, we are not saying that we are the first people who are demonstrating, no. 
actually, I think the pioneer on Illinois is not really far from, from you guys. It, it's sitting in Harvard. Uh, it's really pioneered by the group of Marco Lonkor and others. And what we are really doing is actually taking this, you know, sort of academic, you know, research and, you know, converting to a technology that others can, can use, really. Right. So, so this is a sort of you know, where our interests uh, our interests are. So, uh, I'm almost you know sort of you know, reaching the end of my talk. But let me also you know now I discuss the advantage of LNOI. But let me also just you know, take a few minutes talking about the challenges. Hopefully, if I did a good job by now, you are convinced that LNOI is a really a cool platform of future and in my opinion it should be the platform that actually we can control electronically control light within a peak it, it's not active but we have to use like you know semiconductor to generate light or detect light and use lithium niber to manipulate light but so the question is like if it's so interesting why not everybody is doing it oh first of all many people are doing it okay but the reason is that I, I believe that we don't still have an industry on this is there are like you know, a few major challenges. The first one is the you know high quality thin like wafers of lithium niobate, and this is only has been recently available. Uh, this you know, lit, high quality lithium niobate and insulator, uh, when uh, one Chinese company Nano LN finally succeeded of making this you know various waveguides. This is not you know just only a few years old. And the other challenge is really on patterning and processing of lithium niobate. Lithium niobate is sort of known as being an inert material. It doesn't interact with acids or bases, nor HF can etch it. So it's very difficult material to process. And I you know, saw, saw it few attempts in literature. And you can see that actually many people, when, when they attempt to etch it, they create huge amount of self, uh, like edge roughness. And uh, which leads to like you know uh, like major optical losses, and this sort of I would say our industry started when you know Marco Lanker Group and others uh, you know learned to you know make high quality edges. At the same time, we also invested learning how to pattern and process lithium niobate. And I want to also share you share with you a few of our results. For example. This is few SEM. You can, you know, I want you to take a moment and sort of a little bit appreciate the edge roughness that we can achieve uh, in our process at CSEM. Uh, and you know, when you have such a smooth roughness, you can actually measure really high cues. And you know, I also, you know, show here, uh, you know, one of our measurements, uh, one of these, you know, cavities that I show on the left. So actually, this we can very routinely achieve quality factors above 1 million. This is not really the highest or, or record. Uh, this is more closer to a means or records is roughly like seven times more this value. So we can actually achieve quality factor. We have record uh, values, quality uh, records uh, seven or eight million. I have to see my notes again, but in that ballpark, but we like to we like to report your mean losses because you know when you're you're trying to establish a foundry you're not you know basing your PDK based on record but you have to really rely on mean because you have to guarantee a certain performance and a lot of these results unfortunately you know, I cannot you know share it with you because you know we work with a lot of partners M many of this data belongs to them so I'm not really um, uh, uh, I cannot really share. So I kind of share you one example of the you know experiments we recently did with LNOI in the nonlinear effect. And this might be actually interesting for, for, for some of the people in the audience. This experiment was actually to generate uh, uh, you know for self-locking of uh, mode lock lasers or frequency comps. So using second harmonic generation, uh, we can actually use this uh, you know, technique to actually lock a mode lock laser or frequency comp. So on the, let me just you know, take a moment and, like, for, for you to appreciate this. So what you see on the left is in a nice image is actually just a five millimeter by five millimeter LNOI chip. And it's just a waveguide stretch from one end to another. And from the bottom side, we are coupling it with the lens fiber, uh, irradiating this with the, a mode lock laser at 100 megahertz reputation rates, average power uh, and, and power of 20, 50 milliwatts. And as it passes through the waveguide, the nonlinear effect of so efficient 
that actually out of 1550, by the way, we are pumping this with 1550, out of 1550, you can create other colors and this is so efficient that even you can color see the colors of blue. So on the other side of the peak, normally we have a fiber, but now we put a piece of paper just to kind of, you know, shine it to take this image. But if you look at the spectrum of this, you know, this is a really uh, nice experience we recently did. So you, we, this is our like sort of input pulse, the spectrum at 1550. And through this nonlinear process, you create a super continuum, but also high harmonics. So you can generate second harmonic and then third harmonics and fourth harmonics. Normally these you know, blue lines are higher harmonics. And interestingly that actually your super continuum will beat with the second harmonics, okay? So you have, you will generate from super continuum a wavelength at around 780, but also from the second harmonic. And this is, you see on the you know, inset, the beating of these two. Again, the effect is so, uh, efficient that actually we can see the beat notes FCO of this uh, uh, modular laser by more than 40 dB. And one of the big concerns we had was the stability of lithium ion because you know both lithium ion is known to you know see start to see damage and increase in high power radiation. So we let this experiment run for 400 hours, and you see the spectrum accumulated spectrum in 400 hours. And looking at the, like, the spectral deviation and the island deviation of our beat node shows that actually it, this you know, exp experiment is very, uh, very stable. I mean, it, it wasn't, the experiment wasn't temperature stabilized, so it was just free running. So that's where we, we think that actually this extra drift uh, is actually coming from, from misalignment of the fiber and the peak at the beginning, okay? So I'm all, as I mentioned, I'm at the end of my talk, let me just you know, say where we want to go next. Okay, so now we have this, uh, you know, great platform we can fabricate. So what we want to do next, we can do a lot of experiments, but we want to go beyond this. The capabilities of LNOI platforms are much larger than can be explored by only one group. So we want to offer it now to other external, you know, parties. We have few groups within the TSCM we are offering but people such as Derek Group, and hopefully again, I can find few other partners within uh, MIT, we won't like to actually offer it. And we are in the process of actually making a standard library of building blocks. You know, this is especially might be interesting for industrial partners, because that's how you access foundries, other foundries, okay? So our PDK, or first version of PDKs will have passive components, but this is not where lithium nitride is really strong. I mean, you can find this in any platforms. You're not coming to Illinois to make resonators, but you need to have few of them to interconnect your peaks. So stuff such as Y junctions, uh, edge couplers, grating couplers, NMI, et cetera, et cetera. But really the, the strengths of lithium nitride will be in these you know, active components where we wanna offer this uh, modulate MZIs, tunable cavities, phase shifters, PPLN. I, I don't have time to actually go through the details of uh, the target performance we are you know, kind of aiming in our first release of the PDK, but just a few sort of notes. So we are aiming for the modulation efficiency of uh, 20 volts millimeter for a single arm phase shifter. And if you have a balanced MZI, well, you gain a factor of two, so we are talking about 1.1 volt centimeter or 11 volt millimeter. You always have a trade-off between the voltage, VPI, and also the speed. So the first uh, generation that actually modulators that we are uh, match, like sort of you know, standardizing will be uh, having 30 gigahertz per volt sort of uh, at the speed. So you can always achieve higher speeds if you go to higher volts. If you're interested, I can come back to this. Tunable resonators, PPLN with sort of 150% per watt conversion efficiency, uh, four port version. So this is what we call the varied optical couplers and et cetera. So um, again, I don't have time to really like, you know, compare this, you know, like this performance but with what you can find in the state of the art in a commercially available to our companies who are selling it. But we can actually, we are optimizing for in the first generation is one volt 30 gigahertz. And then we, we will, in the next generations, we are actually expanding the or, or, uh, you know, speed and also, you know, reducing the actually the insertion losses. So what I want to also, you know, sort of, you know, probably um, uh, one before last slide is just 
also mention the you know issue of the insertion losses. So really, we can actually reduce the VPI, increase the speeds, but you know one of our current limitation is right now is insertion losses as any other peak. And what I want to mention is that actually some of this insertion loss, you know, end-to-end -end loss you get from fiber to fiber, part of it is you know from fiber to chip coupling, part of it is losses within the peak. Normally, the losses within the peak are fundamental. You cannot really sort of you know improve it. I gave you two examples. It could be you know this electron photon scattering for semiconductors, or let's say bending losses in bulk lithium nitrate. Lithium LNI seems to be very good at this. Our current limit is really fiber to chip coupling, and this is where we want to actually improve. And this is more of an engineering challenge rather than a fundamental challenge. So you need just more R&D to throw more, more like funding into it. And I appreciate if actually you know people in the group uh, can can actually uh, if you have good ideas, good experience, we welcome uh, collaboration in this regard. So where we want to be in the supply chain of photonic integrated, like if you fabricate one chip alone, it's normally worthless. You need to have other things around it. So what where we we are looking for partners in other like you know at CSM we want to be in the sort of design fabrication and a little bit of testing, but we need actually people who can do like you know design and simulations of our complex peaks. We have actually in, uh, in a collaboration with a wafer manufacturer in France to offer it to, 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 to have a second supplier uh, of LNOI in Europe. Uh, packaging interfacing is a big thing, but also end users. So this is where we want to actually see most of the collaboration. So really end users that actually come and we can actually fabricate it for you. And let me, you know, uh, you know, sort of, you know, stop here. So lithium nitrate. I hope I, you know, by this talk, I sort of you know, convinced you that, you know, lithium nitrate is really a great platform for, uh, you know, controlling light electronically within the peak, and we can actually address many, many different things. I mean, I hinted a little bit of this in telecom, but the possibilities are much larger than this. So lithium nitrate is 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 an ideal platform for applications such as lidar beam steering signal processing, I hinted about the space application. So nonlinear photonic is a big interest. Quantum computing, especially, you know, using ions at, you know, non-telecom wavelengths, uh, sensing spectroscopy and more. And, you know, what I'm trying to say is like, you know, kind of, uh, it's not just you know, if you're interested to collaborate with telecom people. No, I mean, there are big industries in telecom, especially from the academic point of view, we are really interested to, you know, explore more application or more niche application, which is, you know, scientifically, uh, they are more interesting. So let me, you know, kind of stop here. And, and I, I, I would love to actually uh, have your questions if, if there is any, any in the audience. So please. Thank you, Amir. Uh, this was great. And we do already have questions. Uh, Dirk also just muted. Would you go, would you want to go first? No, why don't we start with the audience? There's a question here from Harish Bandari, who says, are there other candidates that can match or improve on the lithium bit performance in terms Absolutely. of like, linearity and refractive index? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, there are. I mean, uh, lithium nitrate doesn't, uh, doesn't have the highest, neither highest electro-optic coefficients, nor the uh, highest refractive index and nor the highest. Uh, so it's somewhere in between if you look at the plot. I mean, actually, if you open a textbook of uh, like photonic materials, you will find probably hundreds of electro optics material. Uh, there are, for example, examples such as BTO, barium titanium oxide, is a good example that has significantly higher electro optic coefficients. And uh, well, I mean, refractive index is slightly also higher. Well, but the, like these materials, you know, we consider them to be less sort of the technologies. They're more into the, you know, early technological development. I mean, you don't have a supply chain that you can buy wafers. So there are actually good works at IBM Zurich. They are working uh, and we are also collaborating with them. They, they have some technologies in BTO. There are other platforms. Again, I mentioned a little bit uh, polymers. There are numerous actually polymers that come with electro-optic effects. Well, each has its own pros and cons. So lithium nitrate sort of sits somewhere in the in the average part, but the strength is that you know it's 
it, you can make it real technology out of it at this stage in 2021. Good question. Other questions? Uh, also, uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, you can ask directly right now. Uh, uh, I, have a question about the, yeah. I have a question about the scalability of this platform. So given that the phase shifters seem to be pretty long because the um, the focus coefficient is not like huge in, in any of these materials in general. I'm sorry, um, can, you, can you repeat? I, I didn't quite get it. Uh, so the, what is the question about the scalability? Can you repeat that? Yeah, it's, it was about the scalability given that the phase shifters are relatively long as compared mm -hmm. to phase shifters in other material platforms. So do you envision to have, uh, let's say like thermo optic phase shifters together with these ones so that you can have uh, fast phase shifting, like fast modulation and slow DC um, tuning or? Well, um, thanks. I think this is a great question. I mean, first of all, I mean, in terms of modulators, I mean, like uh, high speed modulators, I mean, we are not that far from what you can find in other platforms. We are within the ballpark, but uh, like phase shifters or uh, you know tunable cavities is a very good question. I mean, one of the strengths of lithium niobate is that you know you can make capacitive phase shifters. By that I mean it's not a resistive model that you consume light. You consume power. So we are actually, uh, you know, working currently uh, with, with with actually two groups uh, to reduce the footprint of, uh, uh, I mean, we don't have any uh, immediate plans to include thermal uh, tuning into your platform. This is, uh, you know, it, it won't come in our first generation of PDK, it will come next year. But what I can tell you is actually there, we are working in two different sort of um, uh, projects to reduce the footprint of a phase shifter. One is really like making it in, in a spiral format, okay? Uh, but then the downs, like the complexity is like you cannot just simply connectorize, like, you know, just make it this sort of a wavy thing. You have to alternate the, the electrodes. So it needs really two layer metallization, which is what we are working on. The second method is, unfortunately, I cannot disclose it, but there are like really cute techniques that actually you can significantly reduce the, the VPI. And right now with these other techniques, again, we have, we are in the process of patenting it, but we can achieve uh, at low frequencies and by low, I mean below one gigahertz, modulation efficiency of 0.1 volt centimeter. And actually just to hint you where the applications of this is actually, this is interested, especially with for uh, programmable or programmable photonic circuits or uh, photonic FPGAs. So they want to have a modulator, which is at max 100 or 200 micron and operates with voltages below 20, 30 volts, okay? And there is a great way to do it, but it, that method, which unfortunately I cannot disclose it yet, it will come, you can you know, follow our paper, it will come in three months. Uh, it's still, we cannot actually scale it to higher frequencies. So it works with below one gigahertz, we can have 0.1, uh, 0.1 uh, volt centimeter. Uh, and I think this is small enough to do you know, interesting stuff. But thermal tuning is, you know, many people have considered it. We don't have, you know, like a, you know, immediate plan to go there, but we might actually come back to it. That's exciting, thanks. Thank you. And we have a few more questions. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess Ashint is first, then we have Lamia and then Dirk. Hi, Amir. Uh, thanks a lot. It was a very interesting talk. I was just wondering about the material platform itself. I'm not familiar. So how do you obtain this lithium niobate film on oxide? Do you purchase this and or how is it done? No, I mean, we, we don't work on the, you know, like a wafer manufacturing of it at CSEM. We commercially buy it from a Chinese company called Nano Ellen. I sort of, you know, let me just go back. Mm -hmm. You mentioned so that, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this, there is a company called, uh, you know, Nano Ellen in China. And they are uh, selling this, you know, like thin film on insulators. Actually, just I can mention actually the initial market, the initial motivation they uh, they do it is for MEMS, 
because lithium niobate, I didn't really had the time to go through it, but also has a destroying piezo effect. So it's actually already been commercialized in MEMS, and they've been selling this to MEMS industries for, for some years, and photonic people are just catching up. But yes, I mean, I this is available already. And, you know, recently they also released a product in C6 inch. This is where our fabrication at CSM is. We are like, our fab is six inch. Okay, thanks. And then there's a question from Lamia. Uh, yes, hi, thanks for the talk, Amir. Um, Thank you. I was wondering if you guys have uh, looked at like the performance of lithium niobate at far IR wavelengths or longer, and do you think the etching challenges would be much less of an issue, say at like um, wavelengths of like 30 microns or more than um, versus at visible? Yeah, I mean, thanks. For, this is very interesting, uh, you know, uh, questions. And then we recently got actually asked, uh, you know, by an industrial uh, client recently, uh, similar questions. They were looking at the, you know, like a far mid IR or FIR. Uh, I mean, as we, we um, just to be you know, like a disclaimer, we never work at you know above two macro. So the highest wavelengths we have worked. At CSCM, uh, any clients actually be mandatory, uh, you know, from us was uh, the longest was two macron. Uh, so we never pushed the limits in that direction, but indeed, uh, it seems that actually lithium niobate is not transparent above 5.5. I don't know if there is a second order transparency window will open it, you know, higher, uh, longer wavelengths or not. But indeed, the problem would be the confinement of the light. So you, now you need to work, if you want to go to like 10 micron, 20 micron, probably work with uh, really thick uh, thin films, which like nobody offers it. Like nobody offers any thin film above one micron. So I would say for that type of wavelengths, if lithium niobate is even transparent, maybe this ion diffusion technology be a better solution than just peaks. Yeah, there's also, um, there's some efforts where people actually uh, use a, I think a diamond blade, a saw to physically cut waveguides. This gives you a larger remote area. You obviously can't make rings easily and stuff like this, but, but that is another way of patterning because normally the, the, the like the reactive ion imaging is so difficult. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, I mean, great talk. I just had a quick question. Um, uh -huh. Have you kind of looked into the optical power uh, handling of the of these lithium niobate uh, small mode devices, and uh, especially at the at different wavelength ranges? You know, especially in the visible range. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is sort of you know what uh, I kind of hinted in this you know one experiment. I had the time to go a little bit you know through it. Yes, indeed. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, or primarily, or like your first interest in lithium niobate was to see the nonlinear effect. Uh, like this an example here is the, you know, like self-locking using supercontinuum and second harmonic. And in order to achieve this uh, high power, like, you know, nonlinearity, obviously you have to pump it with high power. I mean, high enough that you could get out of the linear phase. So yes, we are actually, you know, this since this is a primary concern. This is one of the first things that we are, you know, heavily looking into. Um, I don't know specifically if you, you know what sort of you know uh, effect you have in mind, but one of the first thing that you know uh, it kind of was concerning for us was the crystal damage at high optical irradiation, and for reasons which we don't yet understand, this seems to be absent in thin film. I mean, people have reported it in bulk, but we don't see it, and we still don't know why. But it just phenomenally, we don't see it. Okay, if I can add a question, um, so you talked, you showed some very nice experiments here on frequency conversion that requires phase matching. Uh, um, you can do that with rings, but uh, to get a broader bandwidth or out of the pole would be great. Have you looked into that? Do you have any plans on PPLN? Uh, yes, actually, like you know, I mean, uh, two, like let me just answer this in two phases. Yes, absolutely. I mean, a waveguide alone itself. You can do nonlinear conversion, but the efficiency is not great. I mean, mm -hmm. if you pull the waveguides, you can you know, achieve higher efficiencies. And PPLN is exactly the next module we're going to you know uh, you know include in the in the oh, next one. Is. 
yeah, so have the numbers three is like periodically pulled waveguides. So or like simulations, we already started simulations. Uh, in simulations, we can actually achieve more than 200% per watt, you know, conversion efficiency and, and the non-resonance PPLN. I yeah. mean, you can always make it into a cavity and enhance everything by finesse. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that actually I can sort of, you know, like flash and advertise, and this is there especially kind of, you know, it came, you know, from motivated from your group, maybe for the people who are interested to access or, you know, sort of foundry, we can you know, maybe take a screenshot of this, you know, one slide. This shows your current stack layer, okay? And coming back to this a little bit, you know, from different perspective on phase matching. So one, once we, I mean, our standard stack layer is 600 nanometer X cuts lithium nibate on a 4.7 micron of SiO2 on silicon handle, okay? Uh, so why 4.7? Because that's a, it seems to be optimum uh, thickness to achieve really uh, uh, phase matching between RF and optics to achieve high frequency modulation. But what we simulate at the time, this, we normally take the 600 nanometer edge 200 nanometer down to form this first layer, this is what we call it the 1515 photonic layer. This thickness, when we simulate it, is very optimized for you know 1515 light, and for a very good reason, we don't etch it all the way through, so we leave 200 nanometer. And then your students came to us and say, okay, we, we are interested to do uh, you know peaks at 780, and then once they simulated, they realized that actually the optimum thickness for 780 is 200 nanometer. And I said, oh well, we have 200 nanometer, we don't need a new wafer, let's Repattern this leftover 200 nanometer to do, uh, and then edge another 100 nanometer to do peaks. So, so now we have these two layers. So you can either make your peak in this 1550, or you can make this and call it to another. And we, in terms of gold, we have 500 nanometer gold as electrodes and three micron of SiO2 cladding, but we offer to remove the cladding locally, whether on top of the electrodes to access them or on top of the waveguides. You know, some, some of our clients came to us and say, oh, we need this you know, sort of particular dispersion uh, relationship in, uh, in, in, a, in a waveguide or in a resonator. And then we simulate it. It says like, you know, if you don't have a cladding, you, you, you kind of achieve that. So. What we are developing, well, this is what we have right now, what we are developing in our you know, next runs in 2020 is to add the second layer metallization on top. So this would allow you to actually do electrical routing. We don't have it offered yet, but this is the next upgrades that actually we will make. And hopefully this actually allows you. So coming back to this in the phase matching with these you know, two layers, we also try to have this single mode propagation at various different colors on the same dye and hopefully be able to convert from one to another. Super. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Stefan, do we have others? Uh, or no, I think that's all the questions. So uh, we should probably switch to the various breakout sessions that uh, Amir agreed uh, graciously to. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us and uh, see you next week. And those that have meetings with Amir, if you could uh, stay around so that we can flesh out the schedule. Uh, thanks everyone. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, a lot. thanks for having me. Super. Thanks very much. Really great stuff.